You're dialed in to the Dealer Playbook Podcast, where it's all about winning auto dealer strategies that deliver proven results. And now your hosts, Robert Weissman and Michael Cirillo. Hey there, and thanks for listening to episode 35 of the Dealer Playbook Podcast. My name is Michael Cirillo. I'm joined with, y'all know him, Robert Weisman. How you doing, hey, my yo. friend? Hey, he's here. Awesome. We're uh, we're super super excited about today's episode. Actually, really really excited. Pumped. Um, yeah, pumped. You know, we we have an opportunity to sit down with um, a New York Times bestselling author, Mr. Rory Vaden. Um, you know, you'll you'll hear more about him in the upcoming segment. But you know, he's really cool. He's written this book called Procrastinate on Purpose, and that sounds so uh, weird at first listening, I guess, to hear that. But he, you're going to hear him explain how inside of your role at the dealership um, or whatever it is that you're wanting to accomplish in your life, how there are certain um, concepts that you need to be aware of that haven't been kind of traditionally talked about uh, when it comes to time management. So we want to jump into our discussion with Rory Vaden. Thanks to uh, Sean Bradley for the introduction. Certainly appreciate that. This was well worth it. And we know that you're going to have just a ton of takeaways like we did. So let's do it. Let's jump right in. All right. Our guest today is co-founder of Southwestern Consulting. He's a self-disciplined strategist and an internationally renowned speaker. His first book titled Take the Stairs was number one Wall Street Journal and number two New York Times bestseller. And his new book, Procrastinate on Purpose, is the first book ever to focus on the emotional side of productivity, and it presents five methods to literally multiply your time. We're so glad to be joined by Mr. Rory Vaden. Thank you so much for being with us today. Hey, Robert and Michael, thanks for having me. It's good to be here. So so excited how this this kind of came together really quickly. We were talking pre-show. Um, we're grateful for the uh, introduction by Sean Bradley, who's an associate of yours and ours. Um, you know, but so glad to have you here and super intrigued by this new book, um, Procrastinate on Purpose, because I think, you know, it really fits in well with um, some of the things that we talk about on the show, which is essentially just how to get more out of our business, how to get more out of our uh, individual day-to-day uh, business efforts so that we can see more profitability. Um, but, you know, from what I understand, this this book kind of came together unplanned and it, it really just kind of was an evolution from your previous book, right? Yeah, the, you know, Take the Stairs when it came out really kind of tackled classic procrastination and and classic procrastination is consciously delaying what you know you should be doing. And so that's what the take the stairs book was all about. It was about how to make self-discipline easier, how to uh, overcome procrastination and how to do the things you know you should be doing when you don't feel like doing them, i.e. take the stairs. Um, But there was a little couple paragraphs in the book that we talked about some new types of procrastination that we see really developing in a lot of our coaching clients. Um, and one of them we called, we, we, we coined this term priority dilution. And priority dilution is different than, than regular procrastination because it's, it's, it's like it's unconscious. And what happens is we get pulled uh, it's unlike classic procrastination that affects kind of, you know, it might be somebody who's lazy or disengaged or whatever. Priority dilution affects somebody who is trying to be successful. They're, they're trying to be a mover and shaker, but they get pulled in a lot of different directions and they have kind of urgent fires that consume their attention. Or in some cases, they'll create stuff for themselves to do so they can avoid doing the things they really need to do, but that they don't want to do. Okay, so and that almost kind of sounds like superhero syndrome, where where yeah, sometimes we create to do things, everything yeah. all the time. Yeah, yeah, but it it forces us to to not focus on perhaps the things where our energy would be most useful. So there's like two sides. There's like the Jedi side of procrastination, and then the dark side. <laughs> being there's good procrastination and bad, right? There's two. Yeah, there there is, there is. That's that's a funny way of putting it because um, you know obviously. The first, you know, take the stairs is about overcoming procrastination. 
And then the title of the new book is Procrastinate on Purpose. And it's kind of like, well, isn't that a disconnect? Well, not really. Procrastinate on Purpose is, is the Jedi side. And, and it's basically how do you uh, say no to the things that don't matter so that you can say yes to the things that do? Um, and, and that's where you're kind of flipping it and using it as, uh, as an advantage to, to learn how to put off the insignificant things so that you can focus on, on the things that really, really create the results that drive your business. Okay. So I, what I really like about this, you know, there's, there's a sentence you talk about in the book. Um, everything you know about time management is wrong. Now we're big time management. We subscribe to the Stephen Covey method of time management with the four quadrants. What, what, uh, would, what would you say is the biggest myth for those listening in today? What, what's the biggest myth uh, uh, that people have in understanding time management? Well, there, there's a bunch of them. And, and we didn't, you know, uh, we subscribed previously to all the things, you know, that you just mentioned and, and spent a lot of time reading, you know, kind of what is out there. And, um, but th- there's two really core things and we'll probably be able to get into a little bit of both of them here uh, on this. But the first one is that everything you read about time management is logical. It's all about calendars and checklists, tips and tricks, tools and technology, the new app, you know, a better way of organizing your office or flow charts to help manage, you know, or plan your week out on Sunday right. and put a letter by all of your most important t- tasks, right? And it's literally for decades, that is what has been said and written about time management. Um, but time management today isn't just logical. It's emotional because when you have more to do than you can ever get to, then the emotional dynamics start to play in, right? We have guilt. There is this this guilt that we feel in the tension between wanting to do a good job uh, at work and maybe needing to stay extra or work, you know, work, work on the weekends or whatever, and also being at home to boot the family. Um, We have a fear of telling people no, and sometimes we end up saying yes to things that we don't want to do just because we, we're afraid of, of saying no. And, and we get stressed um, and we have anxiety and this, all of these emotions that have as much to do with deciding how we spend our time as anything. And yet the human element of productivity has, has been virtually ignored, completely ignored. Um, and that is where the subtitle of this book, uh, The Five Permissions, to multiply your time. That's where permissions comes in. It's, it's about how do the most effective people in the world, what, what we realize that is that they subconsciously, right? They didn't, they didn't even know this, but after spending time and profiling them and uh, we coach about 900 people one-on-one uh, actively right now in our wow. coaching program. And, um, and we started to notice that they had developed certain sort of emotional strategies uh, that enable them to do things and focus on things that others of us can't. Um, and so a lot of times it's our emotions that pull us into the urgent, that pull us into the busyness. And there's, there's almost like a feeling that we get from achieving trivial things. Mm-hmm. Um, and here's a great, a great example. If you've ever, have you ever completed something that wasn't on your to-do list, but then you wrote it on your to-do list just so you could cross it off afterwards? <laughs> no, um, not at all. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and we do that, right, because there's an emotional sense of, of accomplishment. Um, and and, and that's, a, that's an important thing to realize, is that there, there's, no, there's no logical reason why we would do it. Right. It's emotional. And, and, and so that's, that's one of the major things that has been completely ignored. Okay, so and, and I love that you brought up the subtitle of the book, Five Permissions to Multiply Your Time. Th- this really intrigues me. How, how is it, I, I mean, how is it possible to multiply time? Ah, okay, so, so very good. So let's talk a little bit of Dr. Covey, since you guys are Dr. Covey guys, because obviously the late Dr. Covey, I mean, one of the most brilliant thinkers of all time, Seven mm-hmm. Habits of Highly Effective People, literally changed the world. I mean, 25 million copies. It, it's got to be the most seminal work on productivity ever. Um, and, you know, the four quadrants that he talks about, the four quadrants of time management in there, or the time management matrix is what he calls it. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't think I've ever taken a productivity course where somebody hasn't ripped off like Dr. Covey's four <laughs> quadrants right. and been teaching it because it's so pervasive. But, but here's something to think about. 
That book was written in 1989. Think about how different the world is today from 1989. I mean, there's no real internet. It's like there's not cell phones. There's no social media. I mean, the world has drastically changed, and yet most of us are still trying to solve today's time management problems with yesterday's time management strategies. Mm. And, and Dr. Covey's, you know, the, the, to use the, 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 the time management matrix, uh, he basically introduced, I feel, like single-handedly, he brought in this era of prioritizing your time. So previous to him, um, that if you kind of do like a little history lesson on time management theory, Right. In the fifties and six in the fifties and sixties is kind of where time management as a body of work kind of starts to develop. And it's all about one dimensional thinking, which is efficiency. And it's all about managing your time by being more efficient. How can you fit more in by doing things faster? Well then Dr. Covey comes around, he shows us how to prioritize our time, which is basically how to score our tasks and weight our tasks um, based on urgency and importance, uh, in, in his case. And, uh, and so for the last three decades, uh, well, two decades, I guess, the word we have thrown around the word prioritize as like the end all be all to all time management problems. You know, mm -hmm. we say you just got to get your priorities in order or, um, you know, your priorities yeah. are out of line. And, and here's the thing. There's nothing wrong with prioritizing. Prioritizing is still as relevant and valuable as a skill today as ever before. But there is a, a massive limitation to prioritizing that nobody has ever talked about, uh, which is that there's nothing about prioritizing that creates more time. So all prioritizing does is take item number seven on your to-do list and push it up to number one. Yeah, so you still have the, the whole list still waiting in the wings. Right, you still have the whole list, and you haven't created any more time. It's more like you've borrowed time from the other activities to focus on that one first, which is, which is good, assuming that that is the most important. But the way that you multiply time is different. Um, multiplying time is about creating time. And, and, and most people, they, they hear that phrase, multiply time, and they think it's sort of like a, a gimmick or something that is sensationalized, and there's nothing about it that we are sensationalizing. Um, most people think of time as finite. Uh, and, and it is true inside of one day, we all have the same amount of time, you know, 24 hours, 1440 minutes, uh, 86,400 seconds, but multipliers, uh, get outside of the construct of today and they think longer term. They think about tomorrow and the next day and the next day and the next day. Um, and they make what we call the significance calculation. So if importance is how much does something matter? then urgency is a part of the importance calculation. And urgency is how soon does this matter? But the significance calculation is a new third dimension. It's a third calculation, which is how long is this going to matter? And so here in one sentence is how you multiply time. You multiply your time by giving yourself the emotional permission to spend time on things today that create more time tomorrow. Mm. So it's all about how you use your time today. And, and most of us, I actually just wrote a blog um, like a few days ago called, uh, it was like the dangers of t using to-do lists. Most of us use to-do lists and we put them together by asking the question, you know, what is the most important thing I have to do today? And so what that does is it causes us to evaluate how much time do I have available today? What are all the tasks that I, I could get done today? And which one is the most important to do? Um, and it seems like that is, is, is good thinking. And, and it is, there's not, it's not like it's wrong, but it's not the way that multipliers think. It's not the way that Richard Branson thinks. It's not the way that people who create explosive exponential results, they, how they think, what they think is not, what's the most important thing I have to do today. They ask the question, how can I use my time in a way today that creates more time or more scalable results tomorrow. I love this. And, and it's, a, it's a huge difference. It's a <laughs> subtle distinction in the question, but a huge, massive difference.
Uh, This resonates with me because a lot of what we talk about when we consult with dealerships throughout North America, and now actually globally, we have some customers. A lot of what we talk about is a similar concept where it's like, hey, you can take actions today that will actually, you know, pay you kind of an automated dividend in the future. So it's, hey, what do you want to spend your time on? What do you want to spend your time on doing something today that's going to, you know, make the process moving forward so much easier for you or streamlined for you? Or do you want to just keep going day by day feeling like you're, you know, you've got a chainsaw in your hands with a big ice cube and no matter how much you shave off, it never looks like what you want it to look like. Um, So I love this and I love this almost kind of leads into uh, automation a little bit. Yeah. So there's, there's, there's a huge number of applications here to dealerships and automation is, is a good one to sort of talk about because, um, you know, if you look at a dealership and you go, how do you multiply time in a dealership? Well, it's pretty simple. First of all, there's training, right? Uh, it's giving yourself the permission to invest time into training somebody today so that tomorrow they can complete a task for you. Uh, you know, let's say you're the, you're the GM or, you, or, or, or you're the, you know, the dealer, or you're the owner. Um, it's, and, and, and it's spending that time in training, whether it's sales training or, or back office training. Mm-hmm. But, but the other one is, systems, right? It's, a, it's, it's to technology to, to manage, uh, to keep up with your client relations. <laughs> Excuse me. It is, um, you know, uh, how are you, how are you placing, you know, your advertisements online? How are you tracking, uh, your social media engagement? All those, all of those different things inside of the construct of today, you go, who has an extra three hours open in their calendar to sit around and, <laughs> and play, play on their YouTube channel? And it's like, right. well, we, we don't, we don't, but if we can, if we can spend some time to make that system, whatever it is, work, then tomorrow it's going to generate, uh, leads and incoming business that wouldn't have been there before. And it's working 24 hours a day, seven days a week out there capturing leads and, and bringing them into the dealership. Awesome. It, you, uh, um, you know, speaking of automation, that that chapter in the book is is quite powerful, um, and you have an experience, a, a lesson that you learned inside of a coffee shop. Can you can you share that with us? Oh uh, yeah. Uh, so <laughs> I'm sitting with one of my uh, one of my good buddies, and and probably one of the wealthier people that that I know personally and have have a real relationship with. And uh, his name's Darren Hardy. He's an author, and uh, he's a published the publisher of Success Magazine. And anyways. Great guy. I'm sitting with Darren at this Starbucks in the Cardiff by the sea, which is like San Diego area. It's close to where Darren lives. And um, it dawns on me, you know, we're waiting at Starbucks, and it's like Rolls, Rolls, Rolls Royce is driving by, and, and uh, you know, Maseratis, and it's like it's like a car show here at Starbucks. Mm-hmm. Um, and I ask, I ask him, I say, yeah, Darren, what do you think is the difference between uh, the richest people in the world uh, when it comes to money and everybody else? And he basically goes on to tell me, he goes, well, Roy, there's these three different types of people in the world. And if you could, if I could go into Starbucks right here and I could hear the way that they were thinking, I could tell you which people would be rich and which ones wouldn't. He said, the first type of person, let's call them, they probably reflect the lower middle class. Um, They are people who are governed more by emotional impulses. And they would walk in and they would say, uh, you know, do I want this $5 coffee? Yes. And their question would be, what do I have to do to get the coffee? And they would beg for it. They might borrow money from someone. They'd steal the coffee. They'd you know, put it on credit. They're just kind of irrationally governed by impulses. The middle class person would walk in and say, do I want this $5 coffee? Yes. And then their second thought would be, do I have $5? And I said, well, that, it seems fair enough. And it is. And that's very normal. But the way a wealthy person thinks is completely different. He said, a wealthy person... Uh, thinks longer term and realizes that if they spend five dollars on this coffee, that's five dollars they're not investing. And a, a, a wealthy person that's familiar with compounding interest knows that five dollars invested today at say ten percent for the next thirty years would be worth about fifty bucks. So a wealthy person walks in and says, "Do I want this five dollar coffee?" If the answer is yes. Their second question is not, what do I have to do to get the coffee? And their second question is not, do I have $5? Their second question is, is this $5 coffee worth $50 to me 30 years from now? Mm. Um, 
it's a completely different way of thinking, and, 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 and that is what multipliers do. Notice that is the significance calculation. That's exactly a perfect example of what we're talking about, about making the long-term calculation over, of how, how does this play out over time. Well, anyways, you might be going, okay, Rory, why are we talking about and investing and money and compounding <laughs> interest? What does this have to do with anything? Well, here's the thing that hit me like a ton of bricks as I was typing the book. Like, literally, as I'm writing it out, it it, it hits me. Automation is, to your time, exactly what compounding interest is to your money. Automation is, to your time, exactly what compounding interest is to your money. Anything you create a process for today saves you time tomorrow. That's how it multiplies time. So automate is one of the five five permissions um, in the book. But um, just like compounding interest works 24 hours a day, seven days a week, it never stops. It's always working. So does automation. So you may not have, you might think to yourself, I don't have the money uh, to, to, to set up a new CRM system, or I don't have the time to do it. But the reality is the people who say that are almost always neglecting the significance calculation. It is true that you maybe don't have the time or the money or the energy to set it up today, but when you factor in the long term, you go, you, you can't afford not to do that. Because every day, it, it's going to it's going to be painful a little bit on the front end, sure. But every day thereafter that that system is, is doing that work for you, you're, you're, you're getting a return on your time invested or a, a return, uh, we call it ROTI. Um, and, and that is like compounding interest. And, and time, we say a lot, that time is money, mm-hmm. but time is not time is not money. Time is worth way more than money. Um, just like money makes itself into more money, uh, automation makes time into more time. It, it literally multiplies. Okay, th- th- this is so powerful because I I mean you know in, in past episodes of the show we we've talked to our guest about the importance of coming up with processes, and and really I mean that ties into this that if you have a process in place, um you, you know it becomes that automation of time and, and then it leads you to the multiplication of time. But I know there's so many dealers, uh, whether it's dealer principals, salespeople, managers, general managers, whoever, who are struggling today to know what they can do to automate their time or to get more out of their time. So I love this concept, you know, and, and from what I'm understanding here, Rory, it really comes down to putting processes in place so that there is kind of that automation effect, right? Uh, absolutely, absolutely. And some of them can be technology driven and some of them can just be kind of, you know, a process that you have for how you follow up with each new customer or how you follow up with each new web inquiry, right? I mean, it's, it's just about having the process. Plus, if you have the process, it saves you thinking time tomorrow. You don't have to think about how to respond to that thing when it happens because you already you've already thought through it and you're going to repeat that process over and over. Right. I I feel like this conversation with you is so timely because literally in the last, oh, I don't know, about month, where I felt like I was suffering from the worst superhero syndrome of my career, where I felt like I was the only one that could do certain things and I could not, uh, you know, find time to myself. And I'm working from 6 a.m. to 2 in the morning for, you know, the last 10 years or, or thereabouts. Um, I had a conversation actually with Sean um, and he talked about this concept and I, I'm, I'm guessing it's come from a, well, I mean, he, he's very, very well versed in this stuff, but I imagine he's had some conversations with you because it sounds very, very similar. And that was, you know, putting processes in place so that you can kind of take a step back. And, and, you know, I can say for myself, um, you know, this whole concept of automating your time has really helped me personally, um, you know, be able to do so much more and actually focus my energy where it was more worthwhile. But th- this also leads into one of my my last few questions here for you, um, which was uh, this, this big takeaway about delegation. And I know a lot of people listening in, um, just like me and just like the millions of other people out there, have problems with delegation. Can you can you just talk to us a little bit about the emotional dynamics related to delegating? Absolutely, this is a great one because uh, if you ask the average you know dealer principal or just the average person, 
uh, average business owner, anybody who's trying to, you know, achieve something that matters. If you ask them the question, you said, are there things that you're doing in your life, personally or professionally, that somebody else could be doing for you, that somebody else could be trained to do for you? Uh, do you think they would say yes or no? Most of yes. us would say yeah. yes, right? Yeah. Most of us would say of course. And then, and then you would say, okay, why haven't you spent the time uh, to do that? Why, why haven't you taught someone to do it? Oh, the, the number one response that we would hear is people say, well, I just don't think they would be able to do it as well as I can. Or the Which old classic, a, the old classic, well, by the time I show them how to do it, I could have did it four times over. Ding, 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 that's right. me. <laughs> uh, and, and, and so here's the thing. When we say those things, either I, they won't be able to do it as well as I can, or in the time it would take me to train them, I could have already done it. Mm -hmm. That is the classic example of somebody who is absent the significance calculation. That is a difference between what keeps them stuck and kind of always repeating the same pattern of always trying to do things efficiently and trying to move faster and faster and faster, but never creating exponential results and a multiplier. And it comes down to their emotion. So uh, the, the emotion that, that is at play here is perfectionism. And, and uh, most of us have this, this kind of this need to feel perfect and this need to control everything. And so it keeps us from delegating because the reality is if you delegate something to somebody, they might not be able to, to do it as well as you the first time, maybe the second time, maybe the first 10 times. But pretty soon when you make the significance calculation, you realize that sooner or later, not only are they going to be able to do it as well as you could, they're going to get to a place where they could do it better than you could because they're going to be more specialized because they have fewer things going on uh, than you do. And you have delegated that to them. And so the permission here is the permission of the imperfect. Um, the permission with automate is the, is the permission to invest. And the permission with delegate is the permission of the imperfect. Um, because the, 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 to run the math, this is a quick example. So let's say, let's say it's a five-minute task. Mm -hmm. in, in, in Procrastinate on Purpose, um, we talk about in the book something called the 30X rule. And a 30X rule says you should spend 30 times the amount of time it takes you to do the task yourself once training somebody else to do it. Um, so here's what's crazy. If it takes you five minutes to do the task, the 30X rule would say you should spend as much as uh, 150 minutes. Two, almost two and a half hours, right? 30 times five, 150 minutes, almost two and a half hours. Now, initially, when you first hear this, you might go, Rory, that is insane. Why would I spend <laughs> two and a half hours training somebody to do a task that takes me five minutes? And, and the answer is significant. The answer is think like a multiplier, because if it takes you five minutes a day to do that task, and let's say there's 250 working days in a year. That means you're going to spend 1,250 minutes over the course of one year doing that five-minute task. So instead of spending 1,250 minutes doing it yourself, you're going to spend 150 minutes training somebody. So you're going to have a gain of 1,100 minutes. Now, if you do this mathematically, you invest 150, you get back 1,100. That is a return on time invested of 733%. And if I walked up to you and I said, uh, if I came to you and I said, hey, I have an investment opportunity where I can guarantee you a 733% return on investment, most people would go, you're crazy, you're scamming me, too good to be true, impossible, no way. And the reality is that with money, that very often would be true. But I am telling you, there are 733% return on time investments all around you, but it's only the multipliers who see it, and it's because they live in a world that is different from everybody else. They see what no one else sees. They are making the significance calculation, and it is a great example of why the rich get richer and the people who are successful multiply exponentially and other people can't ever get out of that linear growth. Wow. Awesome. 
Yeah, I mean, <laughs> there, there's so much here. I, I feel like um, this was set up for you to just speak to me on on purpose because um, I've had so many takeaways here. Um, just to kind of wind it down here with you, Rory, um, what would your kind of final um, send off message for everyone that's listening in be if they're being exposed to this concept for the first time? Sure. Well, well, the first thing I would say is uh, I, I know this stuff is pretty radical. I mean, it, it, there's, and we're just barely scratching the surface. Mm-hmm. I mean, we explode a whole bunch of things that we used to believe. Um, and so one of the things we've done is we, we put together a free one-hour webinar. Um, and if people go to procrastinateonpurpose.com, they, mm-hmm. can, they can just register and watch the free one-hour webinar. Um, so I definitely encourage you to do that. And then there's also a, a special deal on pre-ordering the book if, if they want to do that. Um, so that's at procrastinateonpurpose.com. But the only other thing that I would say is this stuff is powerful. Uh, this stuff works. This, is, this stuff is different. This, is, is, this stuff really captures the way that multipliers think. Um, but it does not do away with the, the necessity of the take the stairs message. It does not do away with the idea. The, the, even though the first book was about overcoming procrastination, and this is called Procrastinate on Purpose, they actually have a very similar message. And the message is, do the things you know you should be doing, even when you don't feel like doing them. And Take the Stairs was all about how to do that. This book, uh, Procrastinate on Purpose, is all about how to, what to do with everything else so that you can get down to that. And that's what the, the focus funnel uh, helps you kind of narrow down to, to those things. So procrastinating on purpose isn't really the sequel to Take the Stairs. It's really more the prequel. Uh, but the, the message is the same. It's doing the things you know you should be doing, even when you don't feel like doing them. And, and that is something that no matter who you are, you have to keep doing because of something that we at Southwestern um, – often referred to as the rent axiom. Um, and the rent axiom is a quote from Take the Stairs, and the rent axiom says that success is never owned. Success is only rented, and the rent is due every day. Yeah. Wow. I like that. That's cool. That's really cool. Very, 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 uh, very profound. And now that I think of it, so profound that I think our, our friend Lewis Howes actually posted that on his Facebook page today or yesterday. It sounded so familiar. I'm like, where, where did I hear that before? That's so cool. Um, and, and such a, a poignant message to, to those listening in. Um, listen, you, you heard Rory uh, mention that there's a special offer waiting for you listening in um, on his website. We'll link to those uh, that those links in the show notes. You also link up with his blog and his, his social profiles. Rory, uh, we certainly, certainly appreciate your time with us today um, and encourage those listening in to absolutely pre-order this new book coming out that will change the way you well, live your life. Procrastinate on purpose. When, when's the book actually come out? Um, the book uh, is released January 6th. Um, part of the pre-order thing at um, procrastinateonpurpose.com mm-hmm. is that if you pre-order it, we're going to send you, uh, we'll send you the hardcover when it comes out in January, but we're going to send you a pre-release uh, advanced media copy. Uh, it's a paperback copy now so you can get it now uh and we send that as a free bonus for ordering in advance very good very good so absolutely check that out and and again we'll link to it in the show notes once again uh mr rory vaden thank you so much for being with us today oh it's my pleasure michael robert nice to meet you guys thanks so much for having me rory thanks a million man great work good luck brother And ladies and gentlemen, there you have it. That was Mr. Rory Vaden. Michael, I know you like that one, man. That was right up your alley. I, you know what? You heard me say it. I felt like he was speaking directly at me because, I mean, you know, we, we work together. So you know that there are, um, you know, things about handing over the reins or teaching process that can be so difficult at time at times you know having conversations with sean and also you know there's another book that i was reading by a friend of ours chris ducker who's kind of the 
delegation master. Yeah. Um, you know, where a lot of what Rory talked about, um, I, I haven't learned it in necessarily these terms or in this kind of concept, but just resonated so much with me. And I, yeah. I have a feeling did the same for those listening. It, and and it, it really should for, for anybody in a dealership. I mean, here's something kind of, you know, how I, I looked at it and it's kind of a mini way of doing that. To me, it was like, once I started really getting dug in and started getting my, you know, own clients coming in, asking for me repeats and referrals. And I was calling, you know, spending time calling my past customers mm -hmm. and, you know, asking them for referrals or seeing if any other people in the household might be ready for a new vehicle. To me, that was more valuable than standing out there chasing after the fresh up, which they say is a 20% closing ratio. Instead, I was working on getting referrals and repeats that give you that 60 yep. to 70%. Yep. So Love it's it. kind of thinking of along those lines. And another thing like our friend Grant Cardone is always says that like money, they're not running out of, they'll print more of it if mm -hmm. they run out. You can always make more money, regenerate money, but time once you lose it, once you use it, you lose it. Yep. Yep. It's a, it's a precious commodity. And I love just how he's, he's introduced some, you know what? It's forward thinking. It's different. You, you heard him say it, it's radical, but as I listened to it and as he explained it, it almost just sounded logical again. You know, you know what I mean? We kind of did a full circle back to just, well, this is logical. Let's multiply our time, do things today that will buy us time tomorrow or allow us to more efficiently use our time. So for those of you listening in, certainly appreciate you being here. Um, you heard this incredible offer that Rory talked about where you're actually by pre-ordering the new book, Procrastinated on a Purpose, he's going to send Get you a paperback. Advanced, advanced an advanced media copy, man. That's the yeah, inside. The, I mean, that's the insider yeah. club. And, you know, and I was looking at his pre-order page and there's just a whole bundle of other really cool things that he's throwing in. So absolutely check that out by visiting www.thedealerplaybook.com forward slash 35, where we will link you to that special offer in the show notes. And we'll also link to uh, Rory's social profiles and stuff so you can get connected with him there. But until next time, thank you so much for listening in and we'll catch you next week. Take care.